Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a huge honor to be here tonight. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you, Gloria, my teacher, my mentor, my big sister, for joining me on the stage tonight. Uh, and to everyone at the 92nd Street Y, Susan Engel, Celeste Lannan, and uh, my wonderful publisher here from Monkfish, Paul Cohen, and uh, publicist Meryl Zagarek, Jenny Schiff, thank you for being here. And, uh, and to all of you, I can't see barely anybody because of the lights, but I know that you're there. Thank you for coming out on this magnificent spring evening to uh, explore this profound and also challenging topic of intergenerational legacies and healing them. And I also want to give a shout out to all the people who are streaming around the planet. Hello, thank you for being here. So in the ancient Hebrew tradition, it's understood that all forward movement, all advances in life are tied to and predicated on what happened before us, on the past, on the events and the people that, that came before us, that predated us. And the very word in Hebrew, kadima, you might have heard that word, onward, forward, comes from the word kodem, which means that which happened before us. So I invite us all to uh, move our thinking forward tonight by first honoring the past. And if you would uh, join me in honoring uh, a few people for each of us to consider our origins, who are the people upon whose shoulders we stand tonight? Let's reflect upon the role models, the, the great human beings who taught you what matters in life and who, whose love nourished you and whose determination for decency and equality and freedom fostered your being here tonight. So let's take a moment and uh, just call them into the hall with us, if you would. Those elders, those ancestors, spiritual allies, whether from our own family, biological family, or uh, our spiritual friends and leaders. And go ahead and humor me and uh, whisper their names. Thank you. Well, it's Passover this week, and around the world, in the Jewish community anyway, we're reflecting a lot about what it means. This is the festival of freedom. What does freedom mean? What does it mean to live without fear? Uh, the freedom to own your own voice, your own body. The freedom to live and to love who and how your nature dictates and your values dictate. Um, I'm standing here tonight because I'm about to sit down with Gloria. We're gonna have a discussion about the freedom that arises from self-awareness, the freedom that arises from self-healing. And uh, so let's, uh, before we dive into this discussion, let's, let's uh, set an intention that our discussion be for the sake of generating understanding, compassion, clarity, and healing. Uh, there may be images that come up in our discussion. There may be ideas that come up in our discussion in the next hour that unearth, uh, unearth memories for you or uh, old wounds. So I would like to ask that we are all very gentle with ourselves tonight and gentle with each other, uh, both during the event and, and afterwards. And that our Discussion be for the sake of generating, like I said, more healing and, and wholeness, more understanding, more care for ourselves and for the world. And um, I always, because I guess this is clergy privilege, I uh, like to ask us all to log on to the source of life itself right now, the source of all healing, the source of all compassion. 
so that our awareness serve the greater need, which we all share, which is a healed world. Amen. Well, many of us have known intuitively that uh, something all along that uh, with all the resources that we inherit, everything from brown hair to long fingers to musical abilities to a propensity for uh, for uh, loving heavy foods. <laughs> um, we also receive more subtle transmissions as well. It happens sometimes that we receive the residue of our ancestors' extreme life challenges. And that really is the definition. I'd like to just state and frame that definition when we talk about intergenerational legacies. We're talking about that inheritance inherited uh, residue of our ancestors' traumas. Um, the problem is that trauma legacies don't disappear. Uh, they, with time, they don't just evaporate. They linger inside of us, inside of our bodies and inside of our psyches, and then they, they're passed on. Um, so why we're discussing this tonight, trauma, and I, let, me dis, let me define the term trauma in the most simple, uh, simple way is to say that trauma coming from the ancient Greek word wound, the wound is when we incur an experience in life that overwhelms our coping strategies, overwhelms our ability uh, to, uh, to contain it, and so something inside of us fractures. We have to uh, either we fracture or we have to uh, disassociate from what happened to us, just, just as a, a life-saving mechanism. Um, so why it is that we're discussing this is that there's more and more evidence, compelling evidence, that, uh, that there is a residue that is transferred from generation to generation. And that is coming out of clinical research. There's an entire field. We won't get too scientific tonight, uh, but the field is called uh, epigenetics or behavioral epigenetics sometimes. That says that uh, environmental stresses are heritable. We do inherit them uh, in, in some cases. And um, that the effects of our ancestors' trauma may leave a physiological imprint on children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Um, but my research uh, into intergenerational trauma is much more, than, uh, much more than academic. It's really my life. And the impetus for this research came out of my own, my own autobiography. Uh, my mother, I'm the daughter of a mother who barely made it out of Nazi Germany in 1939 on the kinder transport. I was well past 40 when I discovered that her entire family, scores of people, uh, many cousins, uncles and aunts, all but one cousin perished in the Nazi killing machine in Europe. She never discussed it. She never talked about them. And the daughter of a father who was American born, uh, and he served in the US Army in a prestigious squadron, I found out much later, even after he died, uh, a prestigious squadron that was a bomb detection squadron, and he was sent all over Germany into the most devastated parts of the country. And he found himself in April 1945 at Bergen-Belsen, just as the British troops had arrived to liberate that death camp. And he, my father ingested horrors there, is very clear. I never knew this until, like I said, much later. He saw the unseeable. He also took pictures of those ghastly images, and he locked them away in a metal filing cabinet way in the basement of our home. Uh, I came upon them after he died. Well, many Holocaust survivors and many trauma survivors in general do the same thing. We are really programmed to put away, to hide, to bury our traumatic secrets that's common practice because we want simply to spare ourselves, we want to spare others, we want to get on with life, we want to just put them aside. But in the long run, these images have to be reintegrated into ourselves. 
those memory fragments, they continue to live within us and they have to be reintegrated if we are gonna be whole people. Now my parents' secrets came out in mother's milk and they came out in father's temper and they came out in fanatical politics and they came out in weird parenting. <laughs> and it was uh, after years of study, I finally came to compassion. I finally came to realize that they were after all just trauma survivors and that they had uh, they were just exhibiting the normal trauma responses. So agitation and reactivity, hyper-reactivity and hyper-vigilance, that's one. Emotional numbness that prevents us from feeling empathy is two. Shame, big one. And then the, the most quizzical of all of the, the four trauma uh, hallmarks that I discuss in the book the inadvertent tendency to repeat our injury on ourselves or others. In my household, there were six of us kids, and my eldest sister, Shalameth, who uh, had the good fortune of working with Gloria in her life, and my brother Daniel, both were born in the maelstrom of war's end, 1944 and 1945. Uh, both of them died prematurely. Both of them died alone, really cut off. And so I dedicate this work to them. All of us had to find a way to heal ourselves. So I made a study of it. Uh, my way was to go into psychology and the more I learned, the more I realized this stuff is so widespread. It applies to all of us. And um, it definitely applies to the Jewish community, to the Jews who lived through literally 200 centuries and more of, of persecution and scapegoating throughout Christian Europe and, and all over the world. But it also, uh, the whole idea of intergenerational legacies touches our African-American brothers and sisters. Think about that legacy of being shackled and lynched for hundreds of years and uh, into street violence and, and all kinds of racial brutality. It affects uh, our first tribes here, the Native Americans, the original people of this land, and people around the world who have been thrown under the domination of others. And, and finally, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come and sit down with you, Gloria, I, I want to say that as I studied, I realized that the trauma le legacy, the intergenerational trauma legacy, lives in every woman in every woman who has ever been objectified, in every woman who uh, harbors fear of harassment and sexual assault. Uh, someone asked me recently, when did women's trauma legacy begin? And as I thought about it, I thought, oh my God, it's way, way back. I think it started with Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> um, so as I said, trauma legacies don't disappear with time. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna sit down and now learn from my, mm -hmm for my big sister, Gloria. <laughs> so, where should we start, Gloria? <laughs> well, I have to start with saying what a readable, what, this book is subversive in the most wonderful way because it's readable. <laughs> <laughs> The stories are so compassionately told, and you really are drawn from page to page to page. Thank you. And I thank you so much for that, because that, that is a gift in itself. Um, I, we each come to this in our own ways. I uh, come much more through uh, a contemporary movement way, uh, less a generational way. Mm. And really it comes from a, somewhat my ex childhood experience, but not very tra traumatically, more from listening to women yeah. and from realizing how much abuse, sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, deep, deep trauma, just listening to stories. 
And this, for instance, caused me some time ago to help to do uh, a documentary called The Search for Deadly Memories about multiple personality disorder, which is also an effect of, you know, when you just cannot deal with what is happening to you and you invent another persona yes. and another real per So in, in, in my case, it has spread from that extreme to just the fact that because I live in New York and New York is expensive and there are a lot of uh, women organizers coming through from different countries, you know, and I have a guest room, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, lots of people, uh, wonderful women, have, have come through and I see the results there, you know, I see the women who cannot sleep under the covers, who cannot sleep with the door closed, mm. who have what's called easy startle, you know, that if they, they, someone approaches them from behind, you know. Um, I mean, I just see uh, all the varying degrees in my surroundings of, of what this means. I think, you know, if we could raise even one generation of children without abuse or without passing this on, it would be a, a different world. Yeah. We, we are so, uh, I mean, the, of course, the amazing thing is that the human species survives, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that we empathize with each other. I think that that is uh, part of our survival mechanism because if it wasn't the case that when we see a member of our species in trouble, we get a, a f flood of oxytocin, the hormone that allows us to empathize, uh, and we want to help them, whether we know them or not. If you give a baby to anybody, male or female, they're flooded with oxytocin, they want to hold, we, literally we could not have survived without this ability to empathize. And, and that is the, the positive, that is the positive side. Uh, I, I must say it also makes me worry a little bit about the era in which we live when we are looking at screens. Uh, I read someplace an average of 11 hours a day, is that possible? Between mm. phones and, I don't know, but a lot. Uh, and as much as I love books, also at pages, <laughs> including your pages, because I asked my uh, friendly neurologist, <laughs> you know, can you experience empathy? Can, do you get a burst of oxytocin from the screen or the page? And she said, no. <laughs> that actually, we have to be together uh, with all five senses. Yeah. And that is one of the gifts of tonight, that we are together in this space, I think, the why for that, because there's nothing that replaces this. And, right. and really, since the advent of the screen in the 80s, loneliness, depression, suicide has increased. Uh, we, we just, the, it's wonderful, all this technology, but I do think we have to remember to balance it with at least as the same amount of time together as we are tonight with all five senses. Yes. yes. So, <laughs> so I hope that during what is usually called, I mean, the, the question and answer time, there will be mics and so on, you'll see. Let's see, what time is it? How are we doing on time? No, we have a little more time. We've got lots of time. Uh, that you will feel free to tell your story to you know, you don't have to ask a question, you can give us an answer, but <laughs> to, to make us into a circle instead of you looking at each other's backs, us looking at you. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I do think of, uh, that a root cause, the root cause of abuse for women uh, is the fact that patriarchies control reproduction, and in order to control reproduction, you have to control women. So if we didn't have wombs, we'd be fine. <laughs> but, but because we 
have a monopoly, you might say, or an indispensable part of reproduction, then that set up a, if you want to control reproduction, you have to control women. Half of the human race can't control the other half without violence or the threat of violence, and this is called patriarchy. And it did not always exist, all right? It's relatively new in human history. The people who lived on Manahatta Island, here, <laughs> uh, did not have a patriarchal system, did not have gender in their language, did not have he and she. Women controlled their own fertility, decided when and whether to have children. Uh, so I, I say that because it gives me hope, you know, because uh, it wasn't always this yes. way. I think, uh, and I'll add to that, Gloria, something that's very hopeful to me, although, uh, it might be chaotic and there are backlashes and uh, is this, we talked about or earlier about the, the nefarious quality of secrets and keeping things down and um, under the floorboards and uh, this uprising of truth telling that's happening mm -hmm. with women all over the world in India and in the US and really it, it, we keep seeing these stories popping uh, blowing the whistle on sexual assault and sexual abuse. And um, I think that that is, uh, in a way, it's like trauma healing en masse. It gives me hope, it really does, that there is something that, that's uh, starting to make inroads and crater this, mm -hmm. uh, the negative effects of the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So. Um, no, I agree. It's, it's very, very, and it's been building for a lot of years, you know, since, that's right. since students at Cornell named what happened to them over the summer at their job sexual harassment. That's right. <laughs> and then Catherine McKinnon put it in the law. And then, I mean, you know, this has been happening for that's right. building. It's for, been and building. Now and it's the majority. Yeah, right. And I think it's providing uh, young people, young women for sure, young men with a new set of rules and a new standard, a new normal, hopefully. I know that it's chaotic right now, uh, and, and it, but I think in the long run, it's very, very positive. No, absolutely. I think we may, we're getting to the place where we finally understand that democracy, if you want to call it, you know, begins with our bodies. We control our bodies. We control our voices. We decide what happens. With, Without that, there's no democracy. And in that sense, you know, many people, and especially women, have not lived in a democracy. That's right. We've always been, some, not all of us, but substantial numbers of us under control. And it's, it's, it's made doubly bad by racism because you have to, it doubles or, you know, multiplies the reasons for controlling reproduction. You can't keep races separate and therefore preserve racism or caste or class unless you control reproduction. Right. So these things are always, always and always. Yes. Together, right. But I think the, 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 the general umbrella here is about self-empowerment and, and taking back our own healing and taking back the reins of our lives. And, and we do that with each other. We can't do that on our own. That's the, that's the the paradox, mm -hmm. uh, the paradox. No, that's so important. Trauma healing is that we, right. we have to seize back the power to face our loss. These are, all, these are things in the book that uh, these people write about, these people who've gone through horrendous, uh, horrendous tragedies in their lives. Uh, people from all over the world who've lost children to suicide bombings or have been thrown out of their homes and lost everything or seen their families killed in front of their eyes. Uh, these people have done the hard work of, uh, of, of, of doing, of seizing back, facing the losses, and harnessing the power of their pain, finding new community, finding, uh, saying that this, we can't do this on our own. This trauma, this tragedy has changed my life forever, and I need people who understand this. And I need people, I have to tell the story, and I need people where it's safe, emotionally safe, to do so. So finding new, finding new family. And is that always the first step, telling your story? I think it is. To first to yourself. Yeah. First telling the story to yourself, saying, this actually happened to me. I cannot lie. This happened. I am changed forever. And now I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to stay here in a, 
a, a, a big thing that all of these people, these scores of uh, testimonies that I, that I found in my, that I heard in this research was to, um, uh, to resist, uh, to, to seize the, the, the reins of our lives and resist the social call to hate, to blame, to other who did this to me, uh, to become the victim. Uh, it's really about agency. All of these, everyone who, uh, who came through the eye of that needle and who is, uh, whose stories are in this book uh, have this, had this profound experience of, uh, I am seizing agency, I am becoming an agent in my life. And in order to do that, paradoxically, I need other people, other agents. And I think that's true in the world of activism, it's in the true of it's true in the world of, of healing. It's in, true in the world of uh, healthy community and changing our world. Mm -hmm. So what is the very first step, do you think, finding one person you can tell? Well, like I said, I think it's first owning it ourselves, telling ourselves, finding an inner witness, uh, and then finding witnesses out, outside of ourselves. Yeah, and starting to build circles. You talk a lot about circles. Mm -hmm. You talk about yes. being linked with others. Yeah. No, that, I mean, every social justice movement I know of, <laughs> the Chinese Revolution, everything came out of, comes out of small groups in which you can say what happened to you, be listened to, listen to others, discover that you're not alone, it's not, you know, and, and we need that with regularity. That's right. I think there's another dimension here too, which is the intergenerational portion, uh, where there are ripples that go horizontally, but there's also ripples that go through generations. And what we're finding is that uh, doing something here in the third generation actually affects the whole lineage. Let, let me tell you a story about that. Um, I worked with a, a woman, and this is in the book, named Esti. And, uh, her parents were from Iran. Her grandparents were from Iran. Many generations back, a uh, Jewish woman. And she, her family escaped when she was in utero in her mother's womb from Tehran right after the Shah was deposed. And they escaped in a very, very difficult, difficult way from Iran. Uh, she came to me not because she was having problems. She's an American. She was born on this soil. But that her seven-year-old daughter Shiraz was having this enormous separation anxiety disorder and could not pull it together, couldn't go to school, didn't have friends, couldn't be out of her parents' watch. And uh, in working with the mother and working with Esty, uh, we did a family tree and we talked about her amazing family story of escape where her parents literally closed up a whole mansion of things and had took a shopping bag and escaped out of, uh, out of Iran on opium bundles on a donkey cart. Uh, but something was missing. There was a whole side that was missing in this family tree, and I asked her to go home and find out about it, and she did, and she was extremely upset and came back and, and had unearthed a family secret, a terrible secret that had been kept for underground for 30 plus years. And what was the secret? Her parents had had to make a terrible decision to leave, to escape the country, but leave behind a 92-year-old grandmother who was blind and very cogent, very mentally adept, but uh, would have blown the whistle. It would have been much too dangerous for her to, to escape. They didn't tell her. They didn't say goodbye. They closed the door and just left. Well, great heartache. And as all of this surfaced, uh, there was great despair, great grief, the shame of her parents in telling her and owning it, they made a big memorial. It was just a, it was a messy situation. But as the mess was going on in one part of the house, this little seven-year-old became gradually better and better and better. Within weeks, she was asking to go to school. She was asking to get out of the house, <laughs> to, uh, to have friends, to be, she became a normal, carefree little child again. So we see that these circles spread out they link us, but they also link between generations as well. And uh, this little girl was mysteriously acting out a separation trauma mm. that maybe wasn't even hers. There was some secret line uh, with her great-grandmother that she didn't even know and she had never heard of. 
So when we do healing on ourselves, there is that, the, that ripple action that happens this way, but it also happens this way. And everything that we do, I really believe uh, there's almost a mystical, uh, a mystical connection that takes, that, that, uh, that generates healing in other parts of our lives. I've seen it more than once. No, I, th I think that that is the most uh, revelatory thing in your part of your book, which is that it is intergenerational. That is that the trauma, the effect of the trauma is felt now, and also, as you just pointed out, and this I've never seen anyone else write about, that the effect of healing trauma now or, or revealing the trauma of the past has an impact on other generations yes. without the intellectual knowledge. That's right. Right. Both back and forward, which is the, the mystery of it, is that we're, we're you talk about being linked. <laughs> we're linked this way too. That's what I'm discovering, ancestrally and to our progeny. So any little bit of, any little bit of aha or insight or uh, uh, new healing that we come upon really has mysterious effects on our world. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Do you think it's uh, based on uh, biology or uh, who raised us? Nature or nurture? <laughs> That's the old, the old centuries-old question, isn't it? But now I, I think that the, in this field we are, uh, and this is what's so revelatory, that we are uh, that's what's coming out are increasing studies, really compelling evidence that there is a physiological imprint that can be passed down, not all the time, but in many cases, uh, imprints that pass down through generations. Mm. Uh, certainly uh, medically linked, uh, like we saw with the, uh, the Dutch hunger winters, there's uh, tremendous uh, evidence now. Do you know about that? Yes, no, I think you should explain. Yes, the, in the winter of 1944 and 45, the Nazis made an embargo around uh, the northern European countries and didn't, literally didn't let food in. So there were months, the, whole, the entire winter, where people were starving, and many of them starved to death. And the women who were pregnant during that winter, it was expected that they would carry children who would be compromised. That was, that was even back then, they knew that. Uh, what was unexpected was a big study in the 1990s with the grandchildren of these women. And, uh, and the sample study was uh, 93,000, over 93,000 people, so very, very big. And the proportion of people, especially women, interestingly, uh, who were suffering from depression, uh, bipolarity, uh, obesity, and, med and serious other medical uh, concerns was four times the amount of people in a in a similar demographic who had not whose grandmothers had not been starved. So we know that at a physical level, and and it's not only physical because there were mental illness that came out of that that resulted out of that. Mm -hmm. So it does uh, give us enormous compassion for ourselves and for uh, our grandparents, our great grandparents, and for our progeny that we. And for ourselves, <laughs> that we that we don't create all the havoc in our own lives, these things are la some some of these legacies are landing in our in us and in our laps. And the good news is that we can do something about it. We're not in any way victim to it. Consciousness about it, raising awareness about it, um, uh, and then uh, you know, like we see in this book, uh, there are seven principles of healing. Uh, things that really turn the tide for these people, and so what I what I did from these testimonies that I from my research was to glean out what did they all say in common for the rest of us? Uh, what what are their what are the seven common denominators that we can all learn from? Whether we endured and incurred trauma in our own life because we were sexually assaulted or because we uh, there was something that, terrible that happened in our own life or that we inherited it. What can we learn from these people who have become uh, teachers and uh, moral leaders and uh, tremendous, uh, great, the great human beings? And, uh, and so we, we learn from them. And that's really the, that's, that's the, that's the beauty is that we can stop the trauma train. We can break the cycle of negative, the negative patterns.
we do have so much power and awareness, just awareness, consciousness uh, of it is half the, half the work. It's right, very this, empowering. This is a perfect note on which it is. to <laughs> say maybe the lights would come up a little bit and I think they're going to put uh, microphones in the aisles, right? Ah, so that, hello. So now you get to see each other. Hello, hi. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see you. Right, right. <laughs> That's um, much better, isn't it? And, and uh, thank you, uh, the Y, for doing microphones because then we get to hear your voices as opposed to writing down something on a piece of paper or yeah. passing it. Right. Let's see, wait a minute. Who is, who is already? I think this side is prepared, right? Okay. Yeah. So, hi. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, we know each other. It's, it's, it's me, it's Akiva. What? Who is it? Akiva. Akiva. Hello. <laughs> so, I have, I have a, a question for you. Um, I think many, many Jews have been very traumatized by the, the Shoah, and I'm just asking that someone of your depth and your, um, how, how, do I, how do I put this delicately, someone of your, of your background and foreground, both, um, do some work on the theology. Because Re Reb Zalman used to say that we have to deal with the fact that this all happened, that this has been very much pushed away. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of crying, we do a lot of picture showing, and then we just kind of, that's the end of it. <laughs> But in fact, many, many people say, well, what does it mean? And that's still a tremendously open wound, I think, in, in, the, in, in the Jewish world of all stripes. <coughs> and I would ask that, maybe not tonight, but you, you can do it tonight too, but you know, that, you, that you put on your strimal hat and that you actually try to do some deep work so that this can be a little bit um, eased up a little, because I think it's, it's hanging in the air for, that everyone Thank feels you. it. It's a, it's a really important question. Uh, Akiva is, uh, used the Hebrew word shoah for Holocaust, really the aftermath of this huge collective trauma in the Jewish community. And uh, what my, and, and really it's such a, it's, a, it's, it's really a, a very large question. We're not going to do it justice tonight, but um, what is pertinent here, I think, is to say that we know a lot about PTSD. We know how there's a trajectory of disassociation and numbness that we so slowly come out of that numbness and uh, we start to integrate the pieces that have fractured because of this overwhelming and overwhelming trauma. That's for an individual. Uh, what we know now is that there's such a thing as collective trauma, that entire ethnicities, that entire groups uh, suffer a similar trajectory to PTSD. And if, and it's, but it's much longer. So I grew up in the 60s and 70s and uh, in the late 50s. Nothing during that period was being spoken uh, about the show. It was like we were literally frozen. Uh, there was, were no, Holocaust studies came much later in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so there was a deep freeze, just like uh, a person who's gone through a, a serious accident. There's, you ca almost can't even, think about it, you're in a frozen uh, capacity and you're, you isolate yourself now. Um, that, created a, uh, that created its own problems, just that frozenness because a lot of us grew up in that and it was like, what, what the heck is this all about? Let's get out of here. It's too crazy, it's too crazy making. Uh, nobody's talking about the elephant in the room and we went off to India and we went off elsewhere to seek out different uh, modes of spirituality. But the work really is happening. What we need to do as a people, I think, is getting so aware that we are still in this trajectory of trauma, of post-trauma, and that we need to look out for those four hallmarks. Dissociation, where we can't empathize with anyone else because we're so, uh, we're so blinded by our own pain. The shame of it, uh, the hyper-reactivity of it, I think, uh, and, and then, uh, the, again, that most difficult hallmark of trauma, which is this tendency to commit our suffering, to commit what has happened to us uh, and perpetuate it, to repeat the injury elsewhere on ourselves or on others. So whether it's on, in our personal 
in our personal lives or on the world stage, because Jews are on the world stage now, we need to be very aware of and cognizant that we are still in a trauma trajectory and that we have to, uh, we have to heal ourselves and that we can be, we can be aware of these things, of this, uh, these propensities. And I would suggest that this probably has some bearing on many other peoples who have also suffered these kind of ethnic uh, Absolutely. traumas. That's not just us. Th Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. Hello. I wanted to ask your opinion about the music, the inclusion of the music of the late Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, mm -hmm. who in recent years it's come out that he had abused dozens of young women and children during his fame. And this is music that is included in reform, conservative, and orthodox uh, services. So my synagogue actually took a break for a year from singing it yes. because they deemed it insensitive, but now they're singing it again. So the music that we had deemed, stopped singing because we deemed insensitive, now it's okay to sing it. Um, so I wanted to know what your opinions were on if this, how that hurts or helps Do you want people. To that first? Mm -hmm. No, because I don't know about it. So. Yes, I'm very aware of uh, Rabbi Karlbach's legacy. This is a, a very complicated legacy, because there's a lot of beauty in that legacy and a lot of wisdom. And he also uh, he did a, also some, a lot of good work of bringing people back to the heart of Judaism. And I know there's been enormous heartbreak and uh, enormous trauma for many women, and uh, many of whom I've heard their, their testimonies. So it's not easy, and I know that this has caused a big, uh, a big clash within uh, certain circles in the Jewish community. And um, I, I think each, each community has to listen well and honor the victims and, uh, and let the victims lead. And when it's time to start that music again, then, then it's okay. Mm. Uh, and if not, then not. Mm. I, I don't know. It's what interesting, do you think, Gloria. So the question is who decides, mm -hmm. really? Yeah, right. So I think it makes sense that the people who have been disempowered can decide uh, in, in, you know, how that is done is, has to be very sensitive, and, you know, but at least they should have a voice. We're living through this with Michael Jackson now, too. Michael Jackson and so many others, yeah. so many other uh, politicians and, and uh, entertainers and, and, you know, all kinds of celebrities. So the question is, do you throw out the entire work of Picasso? Do you uh, think there's a no. difference when you come to pray that it should be at a different standard than music you listen to at a bar mitzvah? Uh, I think. I mean, I'm not playing Michael Jackson in shul, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and you're saying that it's more sensitive and a more. Uh, well, it's well, a higher. You're saying it's a higher standard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's a it's a real difficult question. I think each community has to decide mm. and be led by the people who, like as Gloria said. Yeah, it shouldn't be done without the voices of people. It seems to me who had the experience. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hi. Hi. Thank you both for your incredible work and leadership, first of all. Um, my name is Daria, and I grew up uh, both here and in Israel. And I am today acutely aware of the way in which the Israeli frame of Holocaust education that starts at the age of three is an exercise in traumatizing and re-traumatizing the generations following the survivors. And my question to you is, how do we preserve Holocaust education and the memory and the, how do we pass on the understanding of the atrocities without re-traumatizing generations, especially, especially in the way that it's used and often exploited in Israel in order, I'm sure you're familiar with the high school trips that Israelis, most Israeli students take to yes. the camps. It's not a coincidence <laughs> that those trips happen the year before they go into the army. That's right. Um, and the trauma that is inflicted upon them that is in turn passed on to Palestinian victims of the occupation and the siege on Gaza. Yeah. How do we preserve the, the, the important history and lessons of the Holocaust without traumatizing ourselves over and over and over again? Daria, thank you. <laughs> 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 
Thank you. I, I feel an impulse to weep at your question. It is uh, such an enormous, important one because it has ramifications and implications for thousands and really millions of people. Um, I, I, this, it's all in the book. <laughs> I, I would say that um, the legacy of the Holocaust, we have to turn the corner here. And it can be, our victimization can be used for political gains and our fear and othering can be used for political gains, and it is, and that has to stop. The Holocaust can be used to remind us of our prophetic mission, which is to be a light unto the nations, which means that the Jewish people, through our suffering, because of our suffering, we can feel for others and that we can, we can be empowered to help serve others and prevent suffering for others. And if it's not used for that, then it is a kind of re-stimulating, re-victimization, right. and, uh, and it just continues the cycle of violence. So uh, it's, it, there's much more in the book about this, and Israelis who are, who are talking about that kind of manipulation that's going on. Um, it, but it is complicated because we do, as you say, want to preserve the honor of the generations that came before us and what they suffered. So uh, how do we do that in the most delicate manner, and how do we, how do we truly honor them? It's certainly not by perpetuating the cycles. Mm. Gloria? Well, I, I, I'm thinking as you're saying that of how we have failed here to talk about slavery yeah. and really, really <laughs> what it meant and means and how long and, you know, we have failed to talk about the elimination of 90% of the people who lived here before Europeans showed up. And so we have not only, I mean, we're, we've missed he, he, that huge culture. I mean, they were incredibly smart about, and they are, because as, as all my Native American friends say, we're still here, you know, okay. But the, about exactly what we're talking about. They always say it takes seven generations to heal one act of violence. All right, it would have helped us, it would have helped us to know that. So I think we have two extremes here. One is uh, remembering, and the, the question is, is it too young or is it not turned into something positive or not, you, you, you know, I mean, that's a big question. Yeah. And then we have here, silence, mostly yes. silence. Yes, and let's empower ourselves and each other to break the silence mm -hmm. and to, uh, to really tell the truth and to honor the, to honor the ancestors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a, a really important. No, question. thank you. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Afi French, and um, so on my personal healing journey, um, I had to seek solace in the divine feminine, just because the traumas of patriarchy were just way too much for me to balance. Okay. So, so my question is, as I'm now moving, I feel like I've been invited to think about the concept of having a positive relationship with the other half because, you know, but because of the trauma, what would you recommend is the vision for the solution in terms of navigating through patriarchy? Are we eliminating it? Are we integrating? Are we healing? Are we forgiving? Are we being strong and demanding a whole new space? Like, I'm really like in a confused state of what the next step is mm -hmm. and especially when the perpetrators are mm. perpetrating, like they're still well, existing. I, I'm not here, I mean, the step that's in you is, is, is the important step, right? But I would just say those days are over, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's probably helpful to point out that it was rotten for men in a lot of ways too, not as rotten, but, <laughs> you know, to be stuck in a limited masculine role. I mean, masculine and feminine is completely made up. It doesn't exist. We're now trying to get rid of this. Sometimes I think the whole world is divided into two kinds of people, those who divide everything into two and those who don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think it's, I've, I at least find it helpful to say, okay, I'm living in a post-patriarchal age and I'm just gonna act like it, okay? If somebody 
comments on how I look, I comment on how he, he looks. He's shocked, not that I'm saying anything negative, I'm not, but just that I've taken the power to define. You know, so if it's that small a thing, and it's kind of fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I just say that you know, and we support, I support, we all support what you decide to do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm a writer and an activist, and I feel uh, such an honor to be uh, speaking in a generation that came after you, Gloria Steinem. You're an icon and have paved. No, I'm the not way. an icon. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. There are so coffee cups. You. I mean, <laughs> like it's the whole thing. Uh, but my my question to you is, I feel like I'm living in this transformative time when we are listening to women and we are breaking so many of the shackles of silence and shame. And my question to you, who is very much one of my personal heroes, is. When will you and when will we be ready to listen to sex workers when they tell their story? Mm. 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 Thank you. We're always, no, now. Absolutely, right. I no, there, I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't want to listen and decriminalize and say, you know, no, absolutely, right. That's wonderful. I, I got yeah. misinformation that you weren't with us on these issues. No, no, I mean, I am not in favor of, uh, Traffickers, of course. Okay, N nobody is. So, so I, you know, I, th I think, I think what's confused. You know, this is another situation in which things get wrongly divided into two. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you. It's, you know that it's either legalizing everything or criminalizing everything, and right. neither is neither is what works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's decriminalizing all the people who are prostituted for whatever reason of their own volition or not, especially or not, and especially kids. But anyway, nobody wants to see those folks, any individual, arrested. Mm -hmm. But the, the decriminalization of everything means that the traffickers and the pimps are also decriminalized, and that I don't think is a good idea. I just want to push back on that because I, I've seen, uh, we've seen end demand policies implemented in many, many countries and we always see violence against sex workers increase. Um, and you know, one of the only countries to decriminalize both the buying and the selling of sex, New Zealand, has seen some of the lowest rates of trafficking, violence, and exploitation in one of the only places in the world where sex workers are able to cooperate with the police instead of running from them. Uh, I don't know, having been there and talked to them, I'm not so sure that that's really what's happening. But in any case, we just have to look at the real situations and try to figure out what makes sense, right? I, I just yeah. think of the right. police as being very much an extension of patriarchy and the way that they control Well, it depends time. what the police do. I mean, the entire uh, European women's lobby, mm -hmm. which is the conscience, you might say, the feminist conscience of the European Union, uh, supports the third way because they have found that that's what works the best. Nothing works perfectly, obviously. I mean, until we don't have, nobody has to, you know, we all have enough to eat and we don't have to sell ourselves, you know, I mean, nothing is gonna cure inequality completely. But it's their opinion that the third way works the best. I, I respectfully disagree, but thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. <laughs> Good answer. Yes, please. Hi, I had the pleasure of hearing you, Gloria, uh, for narrative medicine at Columbia University last year. And I'm finding this hook between the narrative of a story of a patient and the wounds of a woman or a man or a child. And I'm wondering, as we go into 2020 and we have more power, we see more women in positions in Congress, we see more women pushing forward. <coughs> do you think that has also something to do with releasing some of those charge, those stories, part of the patriarchy that we're, we just keep letting go of? Or do you think we get caught because we get caught on other things and it stops us? I'm not sure I understand exactly. As women, the question. do we get caught on the story? Do we get 
frozen in time. Sometimes. Oh, you mean by telling the story, are we perpetuating? Is that what are we perpetuating, or are we moving it forward because the story keeps moving forward? Just like about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Do we sometimes right. even in politics? Because Jews have a lot of power in politics. No matter if it's state or federal, we have a lot of power, and I'm seeing more women step up and make that difference. And those are stories, and those are wounds, and they're stepping into those, into that narrative. Do you see mm. more growth there as, as women? Well, uh, you know, I think we, we, need, <laughs> we need to tell our stories. There's no substitute for, for telling our stories. Uh, but I, I hear you because I think what you're saying is that at a certain point, if you're repeating that story and not able to move beyond it, right, right uh, that that can be uh, a negative rather than, than a positive. Uh, so I think partly that's why we need these small groups. That's right. Because you know, the good thing I find about small groups of women is that they totally tell me when I'm fucking up. <laughs> and stop repeating that, you should be past that by now. And so on. That's right. So, no, I mean, you know, we, we just, it's helpful to be, to be honest with each other and we can accept or reject, but we need that kind of feedback. That's right. It's a, a we, we get into our own echo chambers and then we're, we're, redefining and re-entrenching ourselves in that identity. So how do you see those circles expanding as we do things? Because I believe in those circles and, and them continuing and continuing, but how do we keep expanding that circle to keep? Well, I, I mean, the people in the circle, we can, we can just say, okay, how about next week? I mean, we can just sort of, you know, start easing ourselves into the future a little bit. And this is one of the, uh, one of the positive, really positive, uh, effects of social media and uh, uh, doing conference calls and meeting online is that we can expand. Okay, I, I can't come to that, to the Bay Area, but I can sure zoom in with all of you. And that's, uh, there's a lot of negative about, uh, about uh, cyber technology, but that is one of the great things right now is that we can expand and have a, have a, a, a gathering online for 100 people. And that's, that's elevating. So, yes. Thank you. So the circle can go then in a good way onto social media. It, and have the that. circle can become a spiral moving. That's right. Exactly. right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to discuss um, owning the story um, because when you, that was the first time I kind of heard that phrase, owning a story, intergenerationally. So what if you're at this point in the generation and you understand that everything you're going through is a healing process, but what's come before you, the people before you have never and will never own the story or open it up at all, ever. So what do you do? Can you just let it go? Can you go for is it, can you heal it? Like what? Yes, you, you keep doing it. You keep doing it at your level and having as much integrity as you can as you, heal and turn over stones and find out more, face your ancestry, face what happened, uh, do the work of bringing light to the, whatever it is that, that legacy that you've inherited. And again, there's a, there's a kind of magic that, that happens. Uh, if you are really within your own integrity and not uh, preaching and not putting, you know, pushing other people, uh, but really doing, doing your healing work, it will have an effect, you'll see. You'll get a letter, you'll get a call. There is some, uh, almost a magical quality of things opening up. And I'm not saying that actually from, uh, I come from a very healed family, I don't. I have brothers who won't speak to me and uh, you know, cuts in the family breaks, but you just keep on keeping on. You so keep even on. if you think that, gosh, there just must be something dark there, mm -hmm. but it's never gonna come to light. So you can just, at that point, call it and say, well, I'm gonna move forward and hopefully I won't pass it on because I have four children, but you know, so I won't pass it on. One of them's here with me, so hopefully she's not. <laughs> she's on her phone probably, recording me. Um, but, uh, but so you just, you can 
You mean the previous generation is not telling the yeah, truth? Like it's They're no, just not telling the truth, right? Like, like, yeah, or not able to tell it, the you truth. Sense it. You know it, but it's never going to come to light. So you just take a break and... You put your ear to the ground, you watch your dreams, you uh, honor your intuition, and you and love your kids as best you can. And uh, you never know where this is going to show up. But I don't honestly know any family that doesn't have some dark secret in the past. So you've got a lot of company. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank we have you. time for two more questions, but we can get, I hope, these four in if they make them very quick and brief. Okay. And yes, we want you to speak more than us, so we'll, That's right. we'll answer short, if at all. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Clarissa, and I, I want to say what an honor it is to be speaking to you both. You're both very um, important role models for me. And uh, reading this book was, was very fascinating to me because I did find a lot of pieces that echoed with my own history and family. Um, modern Jewish identity, especially modern Jewish identity, with, uh, Jewish identity for a woman is something that I've been wrestling with for probably my whole life. Um, and... Uh, thinking about this idea of how do we move from an identity that comes from a place of victimhood and suffering to a place of strength where we can feel proud of our identity is a question I've been asking for a really long time. Um, and this book, I just wanted to, to um, talk about a, a study that this book made me think of. It's Great. a Pew Research study from 2013 that asked um, a couple of questions about what does it mean to be Jewish for Jews across America? Top answer, 73%, uh, was remembering the Holocaust. That is what it meant to be, to have Jewish identity. Mm. Uh, eating traditional, traditional Jewish food, 14%, much lower on the list. So I guess I just wanted to use this as a time to say, um, one of the things that I'd like to add to this discussion is thinking about uh, what does it mean, what are all the different types of culture? What are the different facets of having a culture and a cultural identity that might be missing from modern Jewish identity today, especially for millennials who feel priced out of synagogue membership or that it isn't necessarily fitting their needs. Um, what, are, what are ways that we can have Jewish role models who exemplify you know, facets that we want to have in our life and teach to our children and customs and music and food that make being Jewish something we're excited about and something we want to tell everyone about rather than hiding as you know, something that we're ashamed of? Oh. Wonderful, wonderful question. Um, really, the paradigm is shifting radically now. We live in a golden age, I believe. There has been all kinds of renewing of the tradition, and you don't have to get it in a synagogue. I'm a synagogue starter myself, and uh, you know, spent many years uh, forming a, a synagogue community. But there is uh, there is wilderness Judaism and wilding Judaism, and there's. Uh, Kohenet Jewish priestesses, and there is bending the ark. There is social justice. Just Jews everywhere doing activism and uh, gender equality, and really out of the box activism happening right now. And so, whether you're into nature, whether you're into uh, Jewish uh, women's empowerment, whether you're into activism of changing the world, tikkun olam, the prophetic. Remember, we talked about looking back before we go forward. Really, it's time to reclaim our prophetic teachings. And that doesn't necessarily only happen in a synagogue. Excuse me, all the congregational rabbis who are in the audience, but um, it, it's happening in many ways. Get online and do a search. There's a, a huge community waiting for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both uh, for this evening. Uh, the power of small groups and circles like this really is immense, and I think it is mystical in 2016 gloria you came to ireland and you spoke in the west of ireland oh. Oh. and i sp i spoke like this about um my work as a human rights lawyer in sexual violence and domestic violence in ireland and how i thought that as i increased in my power post patriarchy that that would reduce in relation to me and that i found that this was increasing in work and this was before me uh, this iteration of Tarana Burke's uh, Me Too. And as part of that, I told the story about how my uh, grandmother had been born in the Sahara Desert at the time. The Niger was colonized by the French, and mm -hmm. her mother was a child who was raped by a, a, a French soldier. And then the French government took her along with all of the other African children that were born 
uh, from their soldiers to these boarding school institutions and effectively made white and Catholic and, mm. and cleansed. And I was wondering what had happened between the trauma of her birth and my generation. And Gloria, you said to me, um, is the story written anywhere? Can I, can I see it anywhere? And I said, no, it's just in my family. And you said, will you please write it? Because I would like to read it. Well, two weeks later, by chance, through my work, I had dinner with Marion Hirsch, who's the post-memory, yes. and uh, herself and her husband have helped me to come to Columbia. And I've been here for the last three months writing the book. Oh. I mean, I, I what, I should what say could this. be more rewarding than that? <laughs> when, when the Y sent me this newsletter and I saw, and I'm going to buy your book and read it now because actually this is, I'm writing about intergenerational trauma and resilience because my grandmother in her survival gave us all so much and we're not perfect and we're not healed and I think this is all part of it, but um, um, sometimes uh, good things happen in our, our communities meet each other and mm. so thank oh, you thank you and i <laughs> i want to thank you because when when you and i spoke the people of ireland had not yet voted on whether on who owned women's bodies the government or the women and ireland voted so beautifully yes. and I'm, i know that you <laughs> thank you thank you thank you Tirza, this question's for you. I haven't had a chance to go through the whole book, and don't out me, but where is God in intergenerational healing? Oh. Hmm? What? Wonderful, Rabbi Shoshana. <laughs> <laughs> where is God not? It is, uh, this is, this is a God process. Wherever there's healing like this, wherever there's this enormous scope, wherever there's integrity, wherever there's heartbreak, and and using the heartbreak to bring in more light is God. That is a God process. The whole thing, everything, the, every part of tonight is, is a God, a God explosion, a journey of, of the, the divine. Um, my name's Suzanne. I have three daughters. I've taken each one individually, um, Gloria, to see your show, and I'm from Canada. I've lived here 25 years, and I guess my question and my sadness is sort of the state, when you say that we control our womb, um, and just even the decisions that were being made even today with the UN, the special bill in protecting women from rape and how they change the, you know, around yes. the world, the wording. And I get asked the question all the time, when I go back to Canada, we don't talk about birth control, abortion, gay. It's, we decided that ages ago, and we just have moved on. <coughs> Yet here, I listen as people, you know, they don't get their birth control paid for. They're, you know, closing abortion clinics and more and more there's more say in the men are controlling all the rights that we work so hard for are ero eroding and someone said well what do you think the difference is and the only thing I could think of was the religion of the extreme here versus Canada we don't have mm. it doesn't play as major a role at the extremes mm. and that a lot of these people men are I don't know, like why, when we're two countries so similar, why, why is it being taken away here and we don't even discuss it? That's done, we move on. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me... That's a really sad. good question. Good you know, from, from Vietnam to Trump, it's a wonder we're not all in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> And, and religion, no doubt, does, does play it's a role. It's extreme, and so why, why is it being rolled back here? Hmm. But well, I, I'm not, I mean, um, part, part of what is happening right now here is because 
the majority opinion on so many things has changed. I mean, the, the social justice movements, the environmental movement, the, all of, you know, LGP, you know, has changed the majority opinion. And now the third of the country, more or less, that is really angry that they've lost the hierarchy they felt the hierarchy born, if you know. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's the guy who says to me, usually a middle-aged white guy, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to categorize middle-aged white guys, but anyway, <laughs> who says, a black woman took my job. Mm. And I always say, who said it was your job? You know, because the, the problem is this, the sense of entitlement. Uh, and, and that is, and also the, the fact of the changing population. I mean, it's, it's only a, I mean, the first generation that is majority babies of color has already been born. And so soon, you know, this country will not be a white, whatever that means, beige, I don't know, <laughs> majority. Now, that seems to me kind of great, you know, because we're gonna have better relationships with other countries. We're going to have more interesting culture, better food, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the the people who felt promised a place in th this hierarchy yeah. are are now feeling displaced and angry, and voting for Donald Trump. I guess I don't know. And for women's reproduction, though, it's and yes, definitely to control. Definitely, this is the rock bottom issue, right? Absolutely, Thank definitely you. to to control reproduction. And, who, and to decide. I mean, we see this every, every day, and uh, you know, we see the huge differential in the treatment of white women and black women and who is supposed to have children. I mean, right, right. you know. Laura, you think this is a temporary regression? It's, it's just... Well, it, it's, it's a backlash. I mean, I mean, the good news is we've won the majority. The bad news is the minority might win, right? So this is, this is where we are, but I do think it's helpful to realize the distance that, that we have come. And I, my kind of rock bottom <laughs> kind of response is, we're not gonna obey unjust laws, fuck them. I mean, <laughs> I mean Martin, Martin Luther King said it in a much nicer way. <laughs> you know, he said it's our duty to disobey unjust laws. Okay, we, this young man here, um, we have one last question. This young man has been waiting patiently. Thank you, thank you. Um, so my question is, as a white, straight male, who's Jewish, who comes from a wealthy family, I often find myself vilified in many political settings as the ultimate oppressor on the top of the pole of people who've inflicted pain and trauma and suffering mm. on legacies and generations of people. So my question is, what can I do to say I'm with you on many of these social causes because I wanna be a part of the feminist movement, I wanna be a part of all of those things, but I can't get myself to stand in a woman's march rally or do any of those things because I know that people are being excluded because of the fact that they're Jewish and because they invite people like Louis Farrakhan to, this, to the stage and sympathize with those people. So my question is, at what point does intersectionality need to sort of, I don't want to say li be limited, but need to find its healthy area to live and at what point does it <coughs> actually go against what it's supposed to protect? which is our civil liberties and the shared, and the shared sufferings mm. of a lot of people. And going to university next year, I'm a bit concerned because I've seen what happens, especially with regard to how Israel is treated. And every day I battle with the fact that because of who I am as a person, because of just my appearance, I'm, on, I'm at an automatic disadvantage in any situation. And things that are entirely out of my control are used against me to delegitimize my argument in whatever it may be, so that's well, the question. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. You, you, you're asking what you can do, you just did it. You that's just right. did a great I, thing. I, I know, you but, just, but. I mean, you stood up and it's you're showing up. and you want to be Show up, that's speak great. up, and slug it out. And don't allow yourself to, to, to go down to a social, social stigma 
you're being othered. I mean, I think that this is a, in a sense, an intergenerational trauma that you're living out. It landed in you. It has nothing to do with you. You're a good guy. You're just being yourself, and uh, and you're being objectified and targeted. Uh, so you do need to just stand in there. I agree with mm. Gloria. The other part of it is you will find that some of us have kind of terminal gratitude, you know, to <laughs> folks who are with us who don't have to be. So I think that's in store for you too. Thank you. I want to thank our wonderful guests this evening for this very important Can conversation. I, say, wait, wait, wait. Can I, say one? I just I'm I'm so grateful that you're here and I just hope that you might you don't have to do this. You don't have to do anything, okay? But if you feel like it, just look around and maybe introduce yourselves to two or three people you don't know who you're sitting around. Uh, if you came here, you share interests, I'm sure. You could leave here with you know, a new club, a new job, a new love affair, a new, I don't know what. <laughs> but anyway, you don't have to do it, but why not? Okay. Right. And let me say also, that's great, to continue this work, there's going to be an online teaching and uh, community gathering on May 2nd, which happens to be Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, you're all invited to that. I think there will be some cards in the room where I'm signing. Uh, so there are all kinds of groups forming now. There's a whole national network to discuss these issues. So join in. And I love Gloria's idea. Let's stay, linger, and meet one another. Thank you, everybody.